So let's get started. Uh, so it is a pleasure to welcome today uh, Ruben Conceição. So as you know, uh, Ruben is a, is a colleague at LEAP uh, from the uh, Cosmic Ray Group. Uh, and he's also an invited assistant, assistant professor in the physics department um, at the uh, Institute of Geotechnic. So, Ruben obtained his PhD from the University of Lisbon in, in 2011 with work on, on the Pierre Roger um, Observatory. And, and since then, he has been studying the hadronic interactions in atmospheric, uh, atmospheric cascades induced by extreme uh, energy cosmic rays. So in OG, uh, Ruben coordinates activities on, on cascade physics, um, and, and he is also the current uh, coordinator of the Portuguese group uh, participating in the experiment. Um, and so I guess this will be part of, of, of the seminar today. Mm -hmm. So OG, OG will, be, will be the focus of, of the seminar. But besides uh, OG, uh, Ruben is also participating in the Southern uh, Wild Field Gamma Ray Observatory, um, and, and then uh, also co-coordinating co the, the Portuguese participation. Okay, so please. But. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Okay, so, and thank you for being here in this beautiful day, uh, this beautiful weather. Uh, Okay, so my idea for this seminar is to, to present to you, to give you a short introduction of what is the Pierre Roger Observatory. I, many of you already know this. What we have learned about ultra energy cosmic rays and what is going to be the future. And, and the title of this presentation is very ambitious. Oh, sorry, okay. Robert. Sorry. Yeah. sorry. Can, you, can you put the microphone a little bit away from you? It's clipping, it's, it's clipping very hard on, the, on Zoom. It's distorting a bit. Okay. It's better like this? Uh, just try again. And uh, now? Oh, perfect. Now it's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. So, so the title of this or the subtitle of this presentation is very ambitious, but I, I hope that I convinced you that we, in OG, in the Pierre Roger Observatory, we, we are entering in a real golden era and the, and the, for the astroparticle physics field, and OG is leading this movement. Okay, so first thing, of course, now this doesn't work. Let's see. Okay, so first thing I need to, to start, of course, with the cosmic ray energy spectrum, just to tell you that it spans over many orders of magnitude in energy and flux, and I'll be focusing at the very high energy, at the highest energies, where the particles have an incredible macroscopic energy of around one joule. So a single particle carries more than one joule of energy, but they are also very extremely rare, one particle per kilometer square per century. So we don't have a century to wait for one particle, so we built a very large observatory with an area of 3,000 square kilometers. This has been built in, in uh, Argentina, in the Pampa Merida, near the Andes. Uh, and the collaboration itself, this is because this is a big experiment, the collaboration is, is also very big. So it's one of the largest collaborations in, in astroparticle physics. So it's a, more than 400 scientists from 70 countries, countries all around the world. Uh, particle has been here since the, almost since the very beginning of the experiment. Now the, the experiment started the, taking data nearly 20 years ago, we were in 2023, so nearly 20 years ago when I started doing my, at the time it was not the master but the equivalent thing, and it was completed in 2008, and the, the experiment itself is composed by a big array of water sharing of detectors, these tanks here, they have 12 tons of uh, purified water inside and they have some PMTs that allows you to see the particles crossing, the charged particles and the photons that convert crossing. And then uh, around the, the array over, overseeing it, we have four buildings where in each of these doors here, you have a fluorescence detector. I'll go more into it in a, a little bit. Uh, 
just to say that each point that you see here is, is at a distance of 1.5 kilometers. Now, and these 1.5 kilometers can be seen here. So you see this is really flat and you can re almost count the tanks. If you, if you look, you can see like seven or, or more tanks here. So it's, you have a very large line of sight. And of course, this is nature. So, so the, these detectors have to work in very harsh conditions, not only temperature, but deal with all kinds of animals, lightning, fires, things like that, that might happen. Uh, so this is a close view of the tank itself. You see that it has a solar panel. It has an antenna, which is used to communicate to the nearby tower, saying that he's, he, the station has seen something. And uh, on top, you, you have here the fluorescence building. And this uh, uh, building here is the lighter, because we need to monitor very well the, the atmosphere. Uh, laser lighter, so you just shoot lasers to, to the clouds and they, they reflect. Okay, but over the years, there was a big concern to understand what we were looking at, and, and people realized that it was interesting to reach the highest energies, but it was maybe better to understand what was going at lower energies. So what, there are several low energy extensions. For instance, there's the infill, which have, uh, where, where we have a denser array in this area here near the station that's called Coiveco. Um, we have Amiga, which uh, is this, these buried scintillators, muon detectors that you, that you can see here. So you, you just bury them, the, the, the scintillators and you absorb all the electromagnetic component of the shower and you get only the muons there. And then there's these R&D experiments, namely uh, radio experiments that have also been put here. So it's a very rich experiment. Uh, and, and finally, uh, we also added three more uh, fluorescence telescopes that are elevated. And the reason why they are elevated is that, that we want to look higher in the atmosphere to see the shower, lower energy showers that cannot develop further into the atmosphere. So all in all, what we cover nowadays in OG is all this space here. So you can see that we are not only covering the highest, reaching the highest energies, but we are also going to the lower energies. We can, right now, I can confidently say that we are, we can reach something like five to five times 10 to the 16 electron volts. And this is, will be the, the data that I'll, I'll be showing to you. Now, what we measure in OG we we either measure in moonless nights where the the where there's a lot well everything is dark and there's no clouds and no winds so 15 percent of the times we can measure the shower development so what happens is that the shower develops and uh, there's plenty of electrons of low energy electrons this is going to excite the nitrogen molecules and then when they excite, they produce ultraviolet light that then can be detected by these very sensitive uh, fluorescence telescopes. Or we can re record all the time the particles that, the charged particles of the shower that reach the ground. And we can, um, and, and then we can learn about the shower direction by, by looking at the arrival time differences, or we can even get an estimator for the energy uh, which for us is, is the, the, the signal that we get at the 1,000 meters of the shower core. Now, one of the great successes of, this, of the observatory uh, with respect with all previous experiments was the so-called IRI technique. So what we do is we, we want to have statistics and for that we need to be acquiring all the time, whether there's sun or there's the moon, whatever. Uh, but this estimator, as you can imagine, we, we, we're getting the shower, we're sampling the shower just at one level. So it's highly dependent on the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, it, the way of avoiding this is combining events where we have both the footprint at the ground and we have also the longitudinal development recorded by the FD. Because if you look at this, uh, people working in accelerator experiments for sure are recognizing this. This is just a calorimeter, right? We're, we're, but in OG, we use the atmosphere as a calorimeter. And then the integral of this curve is directly the, the energy. Uh, so it's a quasi calorimetric uh, measurement. And we do this for all of our arrays. Uh, 
uh, and for, for the, the smaller ones, the big ones, the, and even the inclined ones. So this is something that we are being doing, consistently doing in energy. The other success of the experiment is that because we have more than one measurement of the shower, notice that uh, for, again, this is mostly sensitive to electrons, so the electromagnetic component of the shower, whereas in the ground I get the electromagnetic component plus the muons. And they, you, you understand later on that they have different origins in the, in the shower. Uh, and because we measured the two independently, we have done very stringent tests to our understanding of the shower, and we could better control our systematic uncertainties, and we could understand that the shower is not fully understand that there's some inconsistencies on what we have in simulations. So this takes me, so this was very brief because I'm pretty sure that everyone has, has heard about this some time. Uh, and now what I want to discuss is what have we learned? We're running for nearly 20 years. So what have we learned about this, the, the highest energy particles that we know in the universe? Okay, the first thing that we have measured is the, the energy spectrum. Oh, this is cosmic. Okay. Is the energy spectrum. So, so this is the cosmic ray energy spectrum. Okay. And if you select this region here and you multiply by e to the cube, you're putting this thing essentially more flat. And this allows you to see structures. So if you see structures in the flux, what our theory tells us, or what, or what our chronological models on particle acceleration in the universe tell us, is that we expect that this is basically a power law. Okay? Now, there might, there, there could be some, some propagation effects or something happening in the source that could create some bumps. And we see some of these bumps. So, so you see that this spectrum is very rich. We have now something, a feature that we call second knee, which is related with the particles that are escaping from our galaxy. We have this ankle, which people believe, it's not proven yet, but people strongly believe that is the transition between galactic cosmic rays to astrogalactic cosmic rays. We have a suppression at the very high energies, which means that these particles cannot, the, the, our universe cannot have uh, more energetic particles than this, but this is still a mystery because we don't know whether this is a propagation effect due to the interaction of cosmic rays with the cosmic mi microwave background or if we, we are just looking at uh, some uh, source exhaustion uh, mechanism. And we have very recently uh, seen this feature, which is still completely a mystery for, uh, mystery for us, which is the, the so-called instep. So it is, apparently this is the name for this part of the, the feet of people. Strong discussion, declaration on this. Um, so it's a very rich spectrum. So, so if, you, it, if it's very rich, it means that you could learn a lot. From, from it, but it's not enough. So the, the second thing that you can think of, instead of looking at the flux as a function of the, the energy, you could think of where do they come from? And also here we have progressed a lot. So one of the things that we understood was that looking at the arrival directions, in particular to large scale, you could see, and taking the highest energy events, you can see that there's a, a large dipole in the sky. Okay, so this is a map in, in galactic coordinates. Last week we had Halsen explaining this to you in very detail. So if you look at the center of this, it means that you're pointing it to the center of the galaxy. If you go along the, the plane, the, the horizontal plane, it means that you have all your galaxy and uh, all the rest you're looking at or down, whatever it means, up or down. But the interesting thing here is that by simple geometry arguments, like Alzen was saying, if something is emitting ultra energy cosmic rays, they should, we should see more coming from our galaxy because the, it's the thing that is nearby us. And when you look at this plot, you see that this is not the case. We see a, a dipole, a maximum for the dipole that is not in the plane of the galaxy. And moreover, I can tell you that if you assume the two MRS this is just a catalog of the, our local masses around us, so the galaxies and the clusters that we have around us. And you, you apply what you think that you know about magnetic fields, astrogalactic and galactic magnetic fields. You can see that this is, this is the mean of this catalog, uh, and this is where the, the particles will be deflected. So it seems to be very consistent with something that is coming from uh, outside of the galaxy. So the main message here is, Ultra energy, 
cosmic rays have an astrogalactic origin, so there's nothing in our galaxy which is powerful enough to accelerate these particles. Now, we have gathered more statistics since our publication, and we are now able to try to look at the maximum of the dipole as a function of the energy. And something that is very interesting is the dipole amplitude, which we expect it to increase with the energy, simply because as you, as you increase the energy, the particles will bend less, so the, the strength of the dipole will get bigger. And if you assume that there's some composition transition, which many people like to, to assume it, they, they, we could even try to predict what's the strength of the, the, this amplitude. Now, here in blue, you see what you expect if the, if the source is emitting protons, reaching a maximum, then emits helium, CNO, and whatever. Uh, in gray, what you expect for something that is not correlated at all with the, 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 the distribution of the masses. And you can see that our data is somewhere in between. So it's neither, neither one or another. But we do see that it, it's increasing. And this tells us that this is not a top-down effect. So it's not a super heavy dark matter particle decaying near us. It's something that is being produced somewhere in the universe and is being accelerated and, is being, and it propagates through the universe before reaching us. This is why this amplitude is growing. Then you could say, OK, but where, where are these sources? So we need to look into the intermediate scale. So we, we, we have done, so there's at least <laughs> half of the collaboration is playing this game, which is we have very little statistics, and we are trying to guess what are the sources of ultra-energy cosmic rays. Because their energy is so, so, so large that even with the magnetic fields that we have, the, we don't expect them to, to curve too much. So for instance, for protons, we expect them to curve uh, about three, uh, sorry, three degrees. So you could start looking at the sky, again, in galactic coordinates, and see whether you see some axes. And we see some axes. Uh, the most significant one is the Centaurus A, which is a very nearby active galactic nuclei. So it's something that we, if you think that you need something very powerful to accelerate these particles, and you have an active galactic nuclei, which is just a galaxy that has a supermassive black hole inside and, and has jets, so it has activity, contrary to our galaxy. You, you could think that this would be a great candidate, but we don't do a claim because we, we, we see only at a signal at four for sigma. There's even other uh, catalogs that we have tested that are more promising in terms of sigmas. For instance, the the, it, it, this depends, of course, uh, where you cut in energy, but the, there's another catalog that is giving good signal, which is the starburst galaxy. So this could also be a candidate for the produ production of these particles. But truth to be said, we, we simply are not sure. And so we need more information just with the spectrum and where the particles are being produced. We need more information in order to, to understand uh, whether we're this, this might be a suitable source or not. And the other thing, so more information means that it will be nice to, to, to learn about the nature of these particles. If you know the nature of these particles, for instance, if you know if they're protons or iron, uh, which is something that we expect, uh, we expect that this ultra energy cosmic rays would be something between proton and iron, uh, because everything else is destroyed you know, in the violent uh, universe. Uh, with the CMB. Uh, so we, we know how much it go, it's going to deflect. So it's very important to have uh, access to the, to the mass of the particles. And it's particularly important to understand if we have photons or neutrinos. Because if you have photons or neutrinos, two things happen. One, we, it will pinpoint the, the source directly. So no, no questions asked. So there's no magnetic field affecting these particles. So we know exactly that it's coming from there. The second thing that happens is that many of the exotic models that say that ultra, many exotic mechanisms of acceleration predict that you should have photon or neutrino emission. So, so we've been keeping looking uh, uh, for these particles. The way that we do this is we just analyze the shower. So for photons, the, the, the main quantity to understand whether a shower is induced by a, a a gamma ray or a, a proton is looking at the muonic content of the shower. 
So if it's a pure electromagnetic shower, it's going to have very few muons, whether, whereas if it's uh, uh, induced by a proton, it's going to have a lot of, of, of muons. And for neutrinos, you look for very inclined showers that will, where the signature is going to be uh, young, well, young showers with, uh, with uh, few muons and a large electromagnetic component, and they are inclined. The, the only showers that can traverse the atmosphere and still be young are showers induced by neutrinos. So this is the, the main method. Now, what you can see in these two plots is just limits. So we have not seen nor neutrinos nor photons. Uh, and this is, well, this is not good for the case where we have protons at the highest energies. Because if we have protons at the highest energies, at some point, protons are expected to interact with the cosmic microwave background. They will produce the delta, delta plus resonance. They decay into, I don't know, neutron and charge pions. Charge pions are going to give you neutrinos. Or, or, or they begin to by zeros and there you'll get photons. So at some point at energies around 10 to the 17, 10 to the 19, we expect to have these, these areas, these shaded areas here are the predictions for the number of uh, neutrinos that you expect if your beam at the highest energies are protons. The same for, for photons here. And what you can see is that for photons, we are reaching this area and we have seen nothing yet, but there's still some space to go. In this area, we are already in the most optimistic models. And again, this is being excluded. OK, so, so, so no photons, no neutrinos. It's, it's a pain. It's hard to, to get these particles. But perhaps we can understand the nature of the cosmic rays itself. So whether what's the composition? Now, the way that we look at composition, typically, we, we look into, we divide it in four classes, proton, helium, CNO, so carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and iron. This is because they, they span the, 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 the important uh, dronic quantities that, that, that are important for the shower are well divided in these classes. And the way that we, the best way in OG to, to look for the composition uh, fractions uh, is to look at the Xmax. So, First, what is the Xmax? So this, again, this is the, the shower development, okay? So this is the atmospheric depth. And the Xmax is the place where your shower reaches its, its maximum, the maximum number of particles. So it's a multiplicative process, it reaches, it reaches the maximum. And from this point on, you, you, you don't have more energy to produce particles and you start to decay. Okay? Now, the place where this maximum happens, you can see here for proton and iron, so you, you notice immediately two things. So one, proton showers are more deep, more penetrating into the atmosphere, which is normal. And iron showers, they, they, they are more shallow. The other thing that you notice is that proton showers will fluctuate more in terms of X max than iron showers. So if you use this information, and in energy we do it by using templates, simulation templates. So you assume that we have a simulation that describes our data and then you try to fit the compositions using these templates. So this is the data and this is the different compositions that were fitted. And if you do this exercise for the different hadronic interaction models, you get something like this. So they do vary depending on the model, but what you can see is a trend. So the trend here is the, at the 10 to the 18, we have a large fraction of protons and then they decrease and they become marginal to the highest energies. Uh, and in the meanwhile, the helium fraction starts to increase and then decreases. And finally, the CNO increases and we have basically no iron. But having said this, notice that we are using the, the FD data. So FD data means 50% of duty cycle, which means that we cannot reach the highest energies. Which means that when I try to understand What's the evolution of the compositions? Uh, I don't have access information in this region. But we can now play the game, and people have been doing that. We know that cosmic rays, these co this cosmic rays, they are coming from a source, uh, they're nearby, uh, we know the, the spectrum features, we know the compositions, and so we can integrate everything that we know. We know about our. Um, our magnetic uh, field, the galactic and the astrogalactic mag magnetic field, I can integrate all this information and do what it's called mass composition enhanced uh, in, uh, anisotropy, which is deriving models 
where instead of trying to understand what is reaching the earth, I'm trying to understand what is producing directly in the, in the source. And this is the best model that we have currently. So if you believe in our data, what, what we have currently is what I was, of course, it has to follow the same trend by construction, but this is also taking into account all the kinks that you have in the, in the energy spectrum. So you have protons that are going to disappear, then you have uh, helium, nitrogen, and finally you should have some component of, of iron. This is very appealing for people doing astrophysics because now you can tune your models to try to, under, to, to try to explain how are these particles being accelerated. And immediately, this plot is a surprise for people doing astrophysics for two reasons. One, you see that there's an evolution and we were sort of expecting an evolution. If a source is, if you, if you take an accelerator and you accelerate something, you expect that the energy that you can give with, to the particle, it's proportional to your ability of containing the particle, right? So if you, if you now increase the, if you, if you now use this argument, you would think that then it's proportional to the rigidity of the particle. What happens in this plot is that we discovered that this is not proportional to the rigidity, it's directly proportional to the mass of the particle, which is harder to, to, to explain. The other thing that is harder to explain is that the injection spectrums that we need to put at the sources to explain these are way harder than those that we were expecting from the point of view of astrophysics. So we are, from the point of view of the, uh, the Fermi acceleration mechanisms, we were expecting that the, the slope of the the spectrum goes with e to the minus two, and we are seeing things that go uh, e to the minus one, which is which means that somewhere in the universe, if this is true, it means that the universe has found a way of accelerating particles more efficient than we have on Earth in, at the LHC. That's what it means. Right. Then we can do more things. If you believe in all this data, you you can also uh, separate your data in terms of x max, so deeper heavier, uh, deeper e events and shallower events. So in, in other words, heavier and light, light elements. And when you do this, again, you see something that is mesmerizing. You see that most of the particles, heavier particles seem, seems to come from our galaxy, whereas the light elements come from outside of the galaxy. We were also expecting this because we, I told you before that, that we this region here is the transition from extra galactic to extra galactic. So if you're seeing something here, you're seeing the, 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 the heavy particles that have not get out of the galaxy yet. So all of this is very mesmerizing and, and, and it's giving something that is letting people to think of. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm always saying if you believe these results is because of what I'm going to show you next. So because in OG we have an FD and an SD, we can take some showers, some very inclined showers. And if I get these very inclined showers, at some point, all the electromagnetic component of the shower is going to die and only the muons are going to reach the ground, which means that when I measure something at the ground for inclined showers, I'm looking at the muons. Okay? Now, muons are very important because they steam from hadronic interactions, so I can use these to probe what the health of uh, my hadronic interactions is description. And this is what we have done. Uh, of course, that now I don't know the energies because I just have the mean. So the, the energy that you get at the ground is proportional to the number of mean. So I need something else. And this something else is coming from the fluorescence detector. So whenever I can combine the two detectors, I have an energy scale and I have the number of mean at the ground. This is 15 years of data. And this is the number of events that we have. Please take a look at this number. It's important for what I'm going to say next. So, but with only this number, we were able to produce this curve. Again, R mu is the number of muons at the ground. The energy is coming from the fluorescence detector. And you see, I can do have a calibration between the, the not a calibration, a measurement between the two of them. And now I can look at the mean value as a function of the energy and also at the fluctuations. So let's start by the mean value. The mean value, and let me start by saying that all of this work and the papers that I'm going to show here were then developed at LEAP completely. So we were leading this, this, this analysis, uh, even doing the theory for, them, for the, the paper, as you'll see. 
So the first thing that I'll show you is that I'll show you the mean number of, uh, of the number of muons as a function of energy. And because I'm doing all these uh, low energy extensions, we also repeat the, the same thing using, again, the FD to give us the energy scale, but using the Amiga, the buried scintillators to access directly to the muons. And what you see is that it seems that the data is marginally compatible with iron, even though the error bars are big. This plots and this is, comes directly from our uh, uncertainty on the, on the energy scale. Now, if you combine what you have measured with, with the measurement of the, the X max that we used before to tell us the composition, and you look at the allowed phase space of the model, so this is for, for instance, a single model, and he, this is what you expect if you have pure proton, this is what you expect if you have pure iron, and in between you have all the possible combinations. What you see from these plots is that none of the models can explain what we observe in terms of number of muons. So there's a deficit in number of muons in our simulations. Now, the, we know about these deficits for the last 10 years, yeah. let's say 10 years. There's been, been many tries to solve this problem. It hasn't been solved yet, which is very weird. But recently, we, we went a little bit further and we were able to compute the relative fluctuations. Why the relative, so the second momentum of the distribution. Why the relative? Because we don't want, we know that there's a problem with the number of muons, so we don't want to have this problem migrating to, to your calculation, so you compute the relative fluctuations. And what we discovered, we, we were in shock, is that for the relative fluctuations, it, it follows our predictions in the, so it's between proton and iron, so there's no excess seen, and it follows our predictions, even though the error bars are big, but it kind of follows the predictions of what we expect from the Xmax. And why is this so weird? This is weird because, because a little bit before we had published a paper it's saying that if someone was able to measure the relative fluctuations, of course, we published the paper and then that someone was, was us that did the measurement. But if you, if you measure the fluctuations of the number of muons, you're basically accessing to what's happening in the first interaction, regardless of what happens in the, in the rest of the shower. And we, we, we demonstrated that the number of muons is essentially proportional to the fraction of energy that is going to a tronic sector. So uh, think of it like you have a proton error collision and you produce a bunch of pi zeros plus a bunch of other stuff. So the pi zeros go directly to the electromagnetic sector. The, the other stuff is what, what remains in the hadronic sector. And we were able to show that this is the case. So if you have an excess in the number of muons, but you don't see it, in the relative fluctuations, this highly suggests that the muon deficit might be related to the description of lower energy interactions. Why is this worrisome? Because we have the LHC, we have Tevatron, we have a bunch of experiments that, to, to which these models are tuned, even more than tuned. Uh, there's a big effort doing sol solving this. So it's really weird to get this result. Now, before I, I go to the future, let me just tell you that the, when I show these things like this, it, it seems very simple, right? Uh, you just measure the number of muons, uh, and then you measure the, the relative fluctuations, and then you move forward. The reason why this was only done in 2021 is because no one would believe our results if it, if it was published before. And the reason is, what we have on the field is water tanks that are, have large uh, temperature excursions. And we have noticed that our tanks are getting old. So we have less light being reflected at the walls of our tanks. So we know that the tanks have aging effects. And if you have 1,600 tanks in the field, and each tank might be slightly different from, from the other one, you don't want to look at fluctuations, right? You say, OK, maybe I don't understand our data enough. But thanks to our colleagues of Coimbra, who, who entered into an endeavor with, with us, we took the RPCs that are being built and used in the accelerator experiments, and we have placed them 
into, uh, into the field. And one of the things, very smart things that we did was to use the high segmentation of the RPCs to make muon otoscopes and investigate the muon, uh, the WCD response to atmospheric muons. Now this, again, this seems simple, but it's not because you are asking to put a gaseous detector that, for instance, the top RPC, the, the, time, the temperature excursion that it might have to deal with is something that goes from, in, the, in, the, in some days, it can go from five degrees to 40 degrees. So gaseous detector and, and the temperature excursions is not a good thing, but it's working, is well controlled. And using this, we were able in 2020, that's why the paper appeared afterwards, we were able to demonstrate using this station, which is a station that is nearby the observatory, it's a test uh, station uh, that uh, is a test station that, that uh, has been there for more than 10 years and we know that has aging effects, we were able to, to demonstrate that there's no aging effects related to the calibration so we can trust our results there. But it's even more than that, we have shown using the high segmentation of the RPCs, we have shown that the agreement between the OG simulations and what we have in this, the, and the signals that we record in the station is at the level of 2%. You can see, so this is different trajectories, so different uh, track length, and this is the charge that you record, this is the date and the simulation, and this is the ratio between them, you see, at the level, 2% uh, I'm being generous, this is even less than 2%. When previously, people thought that the, the, the best that you could control these, these stations was something like 12 to 40%. So this changed the paradigm and allow us to get confident that we can do these measurements. Now there's a bunch of other measurements that we've been doing, uh, uh, in particular, again, for the measurement of the average el electromagnetic longitude profile shape. Uh, I, I won't go into the details, but again, the theory was done at LEAP, the measurement was done at LEAP, everything was done by us, but the message is always the same, and we are partic participating in many other measurements, but the message is, is always the same. If you look into the electromagnetic sector, everything seems fine. If you look into muons, something is happening to the shower that we don't quite understand. And in this late, latest paper that is coming out, we, we can quantitatively say that we do need that to increase the number of muons, but also to change the Xmax scale. So the Xmax is not trustworthy um, as well. Okay, so now I've shown you a lot of problems, right? So there's, there must be a solution for this. And I'm really happy, and the reason why I'm giving this seminar right now is because we are, we are there, we are the future. I'm, I, I say here, let's talk about the future, the future is now, this is happening right now. So the first thing is that there was an upgrade. So this upgrade started like five years ago, it was uh, five. Uh, no, to being deployed five years ago, <laughs> uh, but, but the upgrade is massive, it's much more than, than, than I would expect. So we understood that we, you know, we cannot live with 200 events or 280 events. We need to, to be able to separate the electromagnetic component of the shower from the muons if you want to get more statistics. So for that, we have put a scintillator on top of, of the tank. Then we understood that we could benefit from having new electronics with a, a faster sampling. And then we understood that uh, we could also use radio antennas, which were at the time in R&D, to look at the electromagnetic sh uh, shower component of the shower. Uh, we understood that we would gain if we have a smaller PMT put inside of the tank to extend the dynamic range, and of course, we continue to do these massive holes. You can see this is huge. There's a person here to put these large scintillators to access the number of muons. Uh, so this is a lot. Now, officially, the OG phase one data ends at, in 2021 because then there's a transition and officially it starts in 2024. So at the beginning of the year, but you're already there, if you ask me. Now, the, the timeline, here, so this is the start of the upgrade, that's why I said five years, uh, but, but this is what, what I want you to look at is basically everything is nearly done. So this is what we have in the array. So green means that everything is installed. Uh, yellow means that 
there's water there, we cannot put, <laughs> we cannot go there and put the things there. So that's life. So we are just missing this part here and everything else is done. Now this area here that you're seeing is the RD. RD is the radio detector. The radio detector antenna that are also being placed. Uh, they were not part originally of the upgrade, but now they're supposed to go at least for the whole array. So we're basically there. So the question is, what do you gain having these new detectors there? And what you gain is massive. So before we had only the, the water sharing of detector, okay, if you, if you weren't lucky, there's no FD and you get only the water, the water sharing of detector. So it would be just this LDF and the LDF couldn't go even at close to the core because it would get saturated. Now what you can get is this LDF, we get another LDF for the scintillator, which is proportional to the electromagnetic component. Uh, it's more sensitive to the electromagnetic component, let me tell you like this. Uh, you get information for, from the radio station uh, and you get also information from the, the muon detector. And you can have this in a single event. So this is what we call in Roger now the multi-hybrid events. And you have so many information, there's much more that you can do. The other thing that I want to point, point out is the trace. This is, this is super interesting because we discovered afterwards. So, so we have a higher meaning and, and different detectors so we can really deconvolute the electromagnetic component from the muon detector. Uh, as you can see here, and then this is uh, three micro, microseconds, and then there's this large peak in the scintillator. Now, this large peak is something that you were not expecting. It's the neutrons. So when you have a shower, neutrons lose the correlation with the shower, and they get delayed, significantly delayed. And you could look at these neutrons, and the interesting thing about these neutrons is that they are also mass sensitive. What's the problem now? The problem is that Monte Carlos were not prepared for this. So there's a strong effort now being done to put this into the Monte Carlos. So Monte Carlos were discarding, okay, it's a neutron, it's not traveling. Okay, let it go. But it's there. So, so when you turn on, you see immediately these events and this is physics. The other thing that I want to point out is that before, this is the, the station uh, saturation probability and what you can see is that there's a lot of stations as you increase the energy that were getting saturated. And even more impressive, you don't see very well the energy, but, but, but at the highest energies, you see that uh, until 500 meters, all the stations below were saturated. So we were not getting close to the core where there's more events, where there's more information. And now we can get all the events until the core. So this is a massive improvement in terms of, of what you can do with it. So the quality of our events have increased significantly. But there's, there's more, more. And this is, when I understood this, I was, you know, super excited because I, I loved having the FD working with the SD. But what happened is that RD, so RD, what's happening is that the shower, when it's travel, it's traveling, the shower, uh, the particles, the electrons and the positrons are feeling the, the geomagnetic field. And they are getting, they're, they're creating a dipole. And this creates waves, radio waves, close to FEM, which is a pain, but, but a little bit above. Enough above that I can have a footprint at the ground, and the measurement of this footprint gives me the number of electrons that were in the shower. So I have another, another energy scale, an energy scale that works during the day. So the number of events that that you'll get by combining these two things. And the, the interesting thing is that the, the LDF, the lateral distribution function is really steep. So the, the, these don't really work for vertical events because the array is too, the stations are too separate away. But if you incline the shower, it starts working. So, how much? Uh, sorry? What's the, well, what is the inclined shower that works? Ah, it, it will, uh, uh, above 70 degrees. 70 degrees, which, which above, above 70, which seems nearly on purpose because it's the place where our FD stops being efficient. It, it wasn't like that, okay? But it, it's, a, it's amazing because now you can combine vertical events with horizontal events and increase massively the statistics that we get with always an energy scale present. And what you can do with this is, uh, I, have, I have here just a few examples, just one example that I find really nice there's a paper that is coming out soon 
on latency invariance violation. Everyone loves to do this, but we're doing in a very special sector. We're doing in the adronic sector. We're doing asking the question, what would happen to the shower if the pi zeros wouldn't decay? So it's not the photons. The fo for the photons, we also have things. But for the pi zeros, there's people saying that if the pi zeros don't decay, it's something happening in QCD, and you could have some latency invariance violation. But it so happens that the relative fluctuations of means puts a very strong constraint on this. And we are using these to put the highest constraints in the world. And this is what you'd get once you get these things working, the RD working, this is what you'd get. And you can basically this, think of this like a phase space. The, the lower you go, the more you're constraining. And you can constrain nearly everything with this. The other thing that we are working very hard to do is because we have immune detector now, we, we can improve our photon limits. And this is what you gain just because you're increasing statistics. But you can see that at the lowest energies, uh, you can increase it, increase it very hard. And this is without considering new analysis. So this is just what we have now and what, what you can gain increasing. Why is this so important? Because there was a paradigm before that there was no photons above 100 TV. This was in 2019. Then in 2021, there was no photons above 1 PV. And now we just don't know. Theoreticians stop making predictions. So we just don't know. So maybe there's photons at these energies. So we need to push forward. Uh, I'm nearly there. So th there's something that at the same time is happening in OG, which I like to call the dawn of machine learning. Why? Because our problem has always been we don't have enough statistics. But if you, again, if you try to get, estimate the Xmax using the SD events, the surface detector without the FD, and you're, what you're pick, doing is getting the information at the ground and the, the, the signals that the ground stations get and getting these to, to a machine learning method and, and asking it to predict where's the Xmax. And then you can confirm using uh, golden hybrid events, so events that where you have both information, so we can confirm that there's a, a correlation indeed, that machine learning is picking up something. And because the training was done in, in uh, simulations, we, when you compare with data, we see that there's a bias, but this bias is easily corrected. You know? So yeah, I, I just need to apply something and you can see that I, I remove it, the bias. So one of the problems that by now you understand that our Monte Carlos are not good enough to describe the shower. So this is something that we are very worried. But when you do this, now you can use all the, all the stations, all the surface detector stations. And this means that you can increase your data by a factor of seven, just 15% if you do the math, nearly a factor of seven. And when you do that, and you look at the evolution of the mean x max as a function of the energy, notice that these are the lines for protons for different models, lines for iron for different models. If nothing happens, you don't see breaks. If something happens, you start seeing breaks, and you, you're seeing a lot of breaks again. You have enough statistics to say that you see breaks. And actually, nature might be very hard to us, because when we use the combined fits and we ask what would be the the elongation rate, the, the, the mean x max that you get. So this is coming, this is not data, this is coming from these curves here, these predictions. We see the breaks nearly at the same place. So half of the collaboration right now is getting crazy with this, and they want to publish and say to the world, we have found this. Is it still Ish. Still uh, it's, it, you, 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 you can get the reference, yes, yes. Presented, yeah. In, in a, in a, because it's not consensual, okay? Because there's, there are, the, the, because there are people still worried about this, and there should be worried because we are using a black no, box. Okay, uh, we are using, you, you're using a black box, and this black box is what is giving this feature. So, so it's vital to create strategies to achieve a self-consistent solution for the hadronic interaction models and for the shower description. And we're back to the RPCR otoscopes. And what we've done, we're doing right now at LEAP is uh, we have the apparatus here again. Let me just show you like this. So we have put a new RPC with new electronics that, that can have much more data than before. So we have upgraded uh, uh, to have a more robust and faster acquisition system. 
uh, we already have data and what we want to do is on one hand we want to calibrate the relation between the SSD and the WCD so uh, in, in between the scintillator and the water Shankov detector uh, using these muons crossing both of the stations on the other one, on other hand what we like to do is to test this machine learning methods that we are using with data, with real data, and see whether the performance that we are getting in simulations is compatible with what we get in data. Uh, so <clears throat> this is my previous to last slide. So uh, I don't need to convince you that there's many things that you can do in OG right now. There's many experiments. I didn't have the time to call up, to talk about one experiment that is very dear to me, which is Marta, which is just putting the RPCs below the tank. We have an engineering array also there, uh, about to work, hopefully. Uh, the, the important thing is that you see that all these experiments, uh, a 10 to the 17, 10 to the 17 is the equivalent energy that you would get if you have a proton colliding uh, to, to, to a, a molecule or an atom of air, of nitrogen, and you translate that into center of mass energy, you get the 14 TeV, rings the bell, right? So this is, this is very, very relevant because we can also understand what are what is that we are missing from the side of accelerators. I didn't put here in my talk because I'm doing a noji talk, but let me be completely honest with you. We are desperately looking for the proton oxygen runs that are going should be done this year and for all the reasons most likely will happen the, the next year. And we are with our eyes on experiments like phaser or SND that will tell us something about charm particles because these will produce more muons as well for us. So, so all of these things we are integrating. So we're not alone in the world. And this is my, my summary. So, so we, with OG phase one data, we've learned many things I didn't discuss. We have in, inclusive BSM, uh, beyond standard model searches, geocosmic physics, many interesting things. We are getting something that is very consistent in terms of uh, it, 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 people can, I have several colleagues that already say, we already understand everything about ultra energy cosmic rays because it, you start to get this feeling, but we, we cannot be sure until we understand the shower, but we have all the tools to understand the showers. Once the shower physics is um, understood, we'll get the mass composition and we'll get the ultra energy cosmic ray physics. And this is my last slide. We are not alone in the world. And as you know, in LEAP, we are also participating in this experiment. And what I want to put here is that this experiment is already ongoing and it goes down to 10 to the 16. SWGO is going to do uh, gamma rays and it hopefully it can go up to 10 to the 16. And the muon axis, all the evidence that we have, it, it shows that it's appearing somewhere here. So, so it's really good to have these experiments for the future. OJ is raising the bar, is pushing the experiments. The, the, it's, it's breaking the idea that it's good to do an experiment with a single detector, something that cosmic ray experiments have done for the past century. And, uh, and the future is bright for this field, I believe. Thank you very much. <clears throat>